One definition of Father's Day goes like this. It's just like Mother's Day, but you don't spend so much. And I think that's okay, because I'm a dad who's like, another thing about fathers is we used to carry money where we now carry pictures of our kids. So, you know, for, we're getting a little frugal in our older age, but uh, the cell phone providers will say this. They say that on Mother's Day, it's the peak time for messaging and for, and for calls. On Father's Day, not as much, but they're all memes, and they, and they look like this one. So read it. You've got to read the caption. There you go. I just, that's what I'm here for, to blow, up your, to blow up your planet, I guess. I don't know. It's special to be a father's, uh, father. It is, and it's not special because I'm a great father. I don't see myself that way, but I have kids and grandkids, and it's really special. I'm blessed by that. And I think that God wants it to be a blessing to us. I believe that God wants us to experience what he experiences, which is the love that comes from his children and how they bless him. And and there's a whole lot of instruction on this in the Bible. But there's actually a special book in the middle of the Old Testament. It's called Proverbs. And it's written from the hand of a father primarily to his children, his sons. Now, these are principles that all dads and moms can learn from, all children can gain. But today, I'm, like, again, I think you'll give me some leeway because it's Father's Day, so you'll cut me some slap, slack, ladies. And I, think, you know, I don't think there's a woman or a, younger, a, a girl in our audience who wouldn't want the men in their lives to step up and, and be the kind of man that God wants him to be, so I'm sure you'll support this. But I want to talk about a concept that Josh opened up last week in this series on clarity, and that is that men are to man up and raise boys to be men. We are responsible for the boys in our village. I love that story he told about if you were here, and if you, you weren't, you can catch it on uh, YouTube, that message. But we are responsible to be men and to raise boys to be men, period. So when we talk about clarity, let's make that clear. My contention is it's up to the men in this village to raise the boys to be men, as clear as that. And as fathers go, so goes this church. As fathers go, so goes your family. As a father goes, so go nations, so go civilizations, so go generations, so goes history. Now, I'm not maligning mothers. Uh, It's an equal role in terms of parenting. When, When God created male and female, he said, this is the way it is, and this is what I need you to be, and it's man, woman, male, female, raising kids to be the best they can be. No questions asked. But Proverbs is a father imparting godly wisdom to his children. And over and over again, it says, this is the way. Like chapter 1, verse 8, listen, my son, to your father's instruction. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. 2, 1, my father, or my son, accept my words and store up my commands within you. Turn your ear to wisdom. My son, chapter uh, 4, verse 2, Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I will give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. Jumping down to 420, and I'm doing this to throw the slide guy off. My son, pay attention and do what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Chapter 5, 1. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Turn your ear to my words of insight. 6, 20. My son, keep your father's command. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. Chapter 7. My son, keep my words and store up my commands within you. Keep my commands and you will live. So just all of these statements about here is... Here's the owner's manual about being a human being in this world. I'm your father. I want to impart these things to you. Unfortunately, the high priority and the role of the father is being systematically attacked. And it has been ever since Adam and Eve fell, by the way. But it's become incredibly unclear as to what a good father should be. 
And as you know, there's confusion. And it comes from a lot of different directions. I'm not going to name them all, but there's three big ones I see. The first direction that creates unclarity is our own fathers, me included, because we are all fallen men. We've made mistakes. And, you know, some people have father wounds, we call them. That's we all really have a father wound, if you want to think about it this way, because when our first ancestor, Adam, fell, the first man, the first father, well, he put something in our world that we've been dealing with ever since called sin, and that fall would take centuries to reverse. The true man, Jesus, came and redeemed us from that curse. But no one you know, shapes the understanding of what a man should be in the culture more than another man, and specifically the men who are charged to be our role models, our fathers. And there's a lot of instruction available to fathers on how to do fathering. You can go to all kinds of resources. But uh, I feel like the message we get as fathers from, from, from uh, other sources are things like, you know, be their friend. Uh, spend a lot of time with them. Uh, have fun with them, uh, teach them sports or other things that hunting or whatever, fishing, you know. And, and by the way, I'm in favor of all that. Like, we need to spend time with our kids and do things that are fun and no doubt about it. It's just that that's very incomplete. We do those things, but the prime, listen to me, the primary duty of a father is to lead his family to God, period. Like, that's the primary thing. Everything else supports that. Now, there's some other sources in our culture that work against us as fathers, as men in our village, and that is unspiritual women. Now, I didn't say women, by the way, did I? I didn't say women. I said what? Unspiritual women. Men... We search for our value from you, ladies, like our mothers, uh, the woman we fall in love with, our daughters, uh, leaders in our lives who are women, important women. And when you are spiritually alive, you lead us to be the men we can be. But when you are not, we can tend to wound you and those that we should be leading. And I will say this, the onslaught of radical feminism, which is an aggressive attempt to redefine manhood to create gender confusion and denial, is having a huge effect on how fathers do fathering in our world. And that comes from unspiritual women, by and large. Now, there's a third source, and that is the media. And I'm going to say the secular media, which creates a false characteristic or caricature of what a father is. Okay, and I'm not saying all media. There's good media, and there's good people in the media. I'm talking about the unspiritual side of media. And we are led to believe by that media that real men... Are, I'm going to read a description from a guy named Bob Lapine, who's an author and wrote a book called Christian Husband, God's Job Description for a Man's Most Challenging Assignment. He says, is it any wonder that today millions of men are asking themselves the question, what is a real man? Instead of being instructed by scriptures and discipled by their fathers, young men are watching the media exalt superhero warriors while their moms reward them for being peaceful. They see their peers affirming strength, power, and competition, while feminists scold them for the same behaviors. When we're tough, we're told to be tender. When we are tender, other men look at us as sissies. So what are we supposed to do? That's a good question. Going back to the Proverbs, these first 10 chapters of Proverbs, these are instructions from a father specifically to his children, even more specifically to his sons. And the word that dominates his encouragement is wisdom. Wisdom. 
And so in wisdom, what we do, men, is we set aside all the lies that we're being told. We set aside all the things that are anti-God and his ways in our lives. And we find a track where we can live and teach our kids. And that's called wisdom. Now, I could spend literally hours talking about the things that come out of these chapters, but I only have about, I don't know, 15 minutes, 14 minutes. So here's what I'm going to focus on, three lessons, just three lessons, and then I'm going to fill in a few blanks, okay? Here's the first lesson on how to be a wise father. It is this. It's the most important one. Like, if you just do this, as a matter of fact, you being here makes me believe you want to do this, okay? Lead them to worship God. Lead them to worship God. Here's what it says in chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools, the word fool means one who is morally deficient. That's a fool, one who is morally deficient, Fools despise wisdom and, and instruction. And then in chapter 9 it says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, fear, I get it. Like, here's immediately where we want to go to the first side of the definition of fear. We want fear to mean reverential respect or awe. And it does. It does. A man who respects God, who is in awe of God, will lead his family to God. So when we teach our kids by our actions and by our words, we teach them that God is the creator, that God is all-powerful and he has everything under his control, that he's sovereign. We teach God, teach our kids that God is immutable, meaning that God is just, you know, he never changes. He's always, you know, he's consistently who he is, and you don't have to worry about him being flighty and going different directions with you. Uh, he's a God of purpose and essence. Uh, he, he's, he's loving, he's graceful, he's merciful. Yes, he is those things. We lead our children to revere God, and we do that primarily by our example in our lives. But there's a second side of fear, and that is fear God as in fear. Okay? And that's where some of you are going to check out. Like, eh, nah, my God, because we like to define who God is, my God is not that way. My God is always kind, always loving. He's gracious, beyond control. He is all those things, by the way. But, but he's never going to challenge me to be a better version of myself. He's never going to point out the things in my life that are crushing me and the people in my life, okay? Well, that is just a delusion of your grandeur, okay? That's all that is. So there is a God who we fear, meaning that we understand that God has great displeasure over our sin, and he will not accept it. He will accept me as I am, as I'm changing those things in my life, that matters to God. And so we generally have no problem worshiping and exalting the name of God who's grace-motivated and loving and, you know, love unlimited. You know, that's what we are around here, love unlimited, right? Like, we're not going to change our slogan this week to fear unlimited. There aren't new bumper stickers out, at the, at the, out in the plaza. You can have your love unlimited on the left and your fear unlimited on We're not doing that. God is love, we should be love, but there is something about God where he says, you know what, there's things that have to change, and I want you to be the leader of change. I want you to show this culture that you can change. With me in your life, you can change those things. Patterns that you have created, it's worship, it's worship, like worship is putting God in awe, worship is having fear when I'm disobeying God and giving him the the, you know, the right to have the ramifications of dismissing him. He will judge my sin. He will not tolerate it in my life. He will move it out of my life with all the power he can bring to it. That is what worship is, the worshiping heart. And we lead our kids in this. We lead our families by trusting the Lord with all of our heart 
and leading not on our own understanding. Instead, in all ways, we submit to him and he makes our paths straight. That word submit, like if you think about it, the, def- the definition for that word is think about you laying on the ground on your stomach with your arms out like this, your head down before God. That's what it means to submit. It's your way, God. That's worship. Worship. And that's lesson number one. And I'm, I'm happy you're here today because you are showing your family the importance of that concept in your life. And I know you're not perfect. None of us are. But there's something about that heart that, that, that heart that takes your family to church and brings them into a truth-based fellowship. It's important. Don't doubt me on this. Now, here's a second lesson. Teach them to guard their mind. Chapter 3 says, verse 3, Let love and faithfulness never lead you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Now, when you read the word heart in Proverbs, in the Bible, really, think mind, think philosophy. Mind and philosophy. You are responsible as a father for the heart, for the mind, for the motives, for the philosophies that you teach children. That's your responsibility. And what a tremendous responsibility. Because what a great assault we are facing with our families and specifically our children today in these areas. Look at chapter 423. Above all else, guard your heart, your mind, your philosophy. For everything you do flows from it. Guard your mind because everything of life, your motives, your conduct, the way you think about life and the way you think about human beings and the way you think about God, it's all right here. It's all right here. You know, it's, it's there. We protect our children from the philosophies and the thinking of the world that is opposed to God. Just as importantly and as surely that we fill their minds with God's word, we protect them from the challenges of this world. We show them that God's way is the way. We guard them. If you have kids that are, you know, young kids, I say young kids, anybody that's still living in your home that is relying on you, you got to monitor their lives. You've got to be the one that speaks into what they're taking in, and you've got to be cautious of that. You prepare them to take on the world as an adult with courage and conviction, with the right kinds of heart and mind. You're the father you have the responsibility to that. Now, here's a third great lesson, and it's yours to instill. Very, very important. You teach them how to select companions. Companions. Your responsibility to teach your children how to choose their companions. Paul has a warning in this. He says, bad company corrupts good morals. Your children, and you know this, will not rise above the level of their associations. They're going to be right there with them. They might be the leaders of those. Rarely does a child have the capability to elevate themselves beyond the constituent group of which they are functioning. So you have to help them select, help them to learn how to select companions who will live in their world and teach them how to live. Go back to chapter 1. I'll give you an illustration right from chapter 1, verse 10. Here's what he says. My son, if, if sinful men entice you, do not give in to them. If, if they say, come along with us, let us lie in wait for innocent blood. Let us ambush some harmless soul. By the way, most people aren't going to use that language. But there's a, something behind it that they might be doing. He says this, these men lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush only themselves. Such are the paths of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the life of those who get it. Here's the point. Here's the gang. There's a gang. Okay, there's always a gang. I mean, there are gangs in the street, gangs that they exist, right, who suck kids in 
to do horrible things to themselves and other people. There are gangs like that. There's all kinds of gangs, okay? There are thugs in the streets. There are drinking gangs. There, there's drugging gangs. There's, there's greed gangs, you know, who profit by exploiting innocent people just to make money. There are philosophical and political gangs. <laughs> they kill through their means more, you know, appropriate means. They are killers. What kind of politics are your children being exposed to? And what are you doing about that? I'll tell you what. There's tremendous peer pressure on our kids to conform to conduct that opposes everything that God wants for us. But we have to teach them how to select their companions, not so that they will be selected by the gang. The whole appeal here is that you are responsible. Chapter 211, you make sure your children aren't the victim of those who have left the straight paths, who walk in dark ways, who delight in doing wrong, who rejoice in the perverseness of evil, whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. And there's a plenty of them, friends. You know that. Lead them how to make friends, the right kind of friends, friends who lift them up, friends whose politics and philosophies revere and fear God and put him in the pedestal of life, okay? Now, realize that there are a lot of other lessons that we could learn today. I think those three are the base. Uh, I'm gonna spit out a few more that support the base of fathering because this is kind of the sunflower approach to, to fathering. I've got some right here, and these are David sunflower seeds, meaning that they're Old Testament from sunflower seeds. And, and so they're really good, by the way. I, I eat a lot of them. But what I mean by this is when you eat a seed, you generally put one in your mouth or maybe a bunch of them. I don't know. I don't know how you do it. And then you crunch around and then, you know, you, you spit out all the shells. Most of you, if you're, if you're human, you do that. And then, you, and then you swallow the good, you know, the good fruit or the meat inside and you devour that. So I want to give you like a sunflower seed you know, spit and chew type experience right now with the Proverbs. Just very quickly, what else do we teach our kids? How do we lead them? Well, first of all, we teach them by obeying their parents and those who you choose to have authority in their lives, who you choose. You choose, because you're the parent, okay? Here's what it says in chapter 1, verse 10. Hear, my son, accept my sayings. Obey me. I have directed you in the way of wisdom. Obey me. Do what I say. My son, incline your ear to my sayings. Obey me. It's your responsibility to teach them that. No one else is going to do it. We lead them by teaching them to obey parents. We lead them by teaching them to control their bodies and desires to embrace God's design for human sexuality. And we could go all day on that. But, and by the way, we've talked about it in the last few sermons, so I'm not going to get into it. But here's the point. It's our responsibility. You read the first 10 chapters of the book. It's a father teaching his sons about how promiscuity and adultery will wreck their lives and kill the ones they love. You teach them that lesson. You lead them in that. We lead our children to watch their words, to be careful with their speech. Chapter 4, 24. Put away from you a deceitful mouth. Put devious lips far from you. Teach them how to speak with honesty and integrity. And if you say yes, then do the yes and make them do it too. And if you say no, you make them do the no too. That is what it means to teach them integrity with your words, that and other things. Speak pure, true words. Teach them how to work. Chapter six, dads, this is your chapter right here. Chapter six, in summary, dad, teach your children how to work without a boss around because if you do that, they'll be self-sufficient for the rest of your life. Can I hear an amen on that? Right there, amen, right? Amen. Teach and lead your kids to care for their neighbors. Love them. Live with your neighbors. Live in peace. Forgive your neighbors. They're going to need it sometimes. Meet your neighbor's needs when you can. One more. And this is the one that I want to lead into our time in communion with. Lead them to be the friend 
and to have the right friend. Going back to what I said about that, the eheb, that's the Greek word, a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Jesus is that friend. And they will likely not find Jesus. At least it will be much more difficult for them unless you lead them to him. And you show them that among all your other relationships, even their mother, this is my best friend. He's the one that never leaves me, never forsakes me. He's the one that stepped into my mess and saved me. And he will do that for you, my daughter, my son. He's the best. Lord, as we commune today, we're just honoring you for that. Like you're the one who stepped into our humanity and you overcame, you know, the the sins of our first father, Adam, and every other sin that followed. And you came in as the man who never sinned, the man who showed us what life can really be like. You partnered with us to bring us back to our true identity. We are grateful to you, Father, our Jesus, our brother. Amen. Dude, you, you got it. You got this. It's just as simple as that, right? It's just as simple as today. This, just decide today. No matter what yesterday brought, no matter what tomorrow scares you about, today you say, I'm going to worship God. That means I'm going to have reverential fear for my Lord and my God. I'm going to live my life that way. And I'm going to guard my mind and teach them to guard theirs. And, you know, it's, it's tough, but I'm going to show them the kinds of people who can build them up and be in this life with God that we're in. And you're here and you're willing. I know by you being here, you're willing. I think it means a lot to your family that you're here you're leading him this, them this way. Now, I, I did want to read you this. I think it just kind of hits it pretty well. I read this this week. I didn't write this, but here's what it says. You have this duty as a father, and I want to make it as clear as it can be. If you fail, Dad, to teach your son to fear God, the devil would teach him to hate God. If you fail to teach your son to guard his mind, the devil will gladly teach him to have an open mind that leads him to an open grave. If you fail to teach your son to obey his parents, the devil will teach him to rebel and break their heart. If you fail to teach your son to select his companions, the devil will gladly choose them for him. If you fail to teach your son to control his body, the devil will teach him to give it over completely to lust. If you fail to teach your son to enjoy the marriage partner that God has gifted them with, your son will teach him to destroy them and himself. If you fail to teach your son to pursue his work, the devil will make his laziness a tool of hell. And if you fail to teach your son to manage his money, the devil will teach him to waste it. And if you fail to teach your son to love his neighbor, the devil will gladly teach him to love only himself. Oh my, my man. I mean, that's a lot to, that's a lot to chew and to spit and to devour. But we have a responsibility. And you know what? I think you're up to it. As a matter of fact, I believe you are. As I've stood out on the patio, as you've come in, as people have left, I looked at man after man after man that I'm so proud of. Men who are willing to say, God, we're going to do this your way. And I'm going to adjust to that. I'm going to leave my family that way. You got it. Happy Father's Day. <laughs>